so if I stand here, you want me to sit down. Uh, first thing is, can I just check? We, we said we'd give away a free board to any school teacher who came along. Can I confirm we actually haven't got a school teacher here? <laughs> Which is deeply depressing. We have one guy, but I, don't think, I think he blew out yesterday, so um, it's a bit of a shame. Okay, so I'm going to talk about hardware modeling. The, uh, and really, this is to give you a feel for all the things you can do to model your design before you go through the pain of using quarters to put it on your FPGA. Um, I have to say, for me, it was education yesterday, it's quite how painful that is compared to doing this sort of thing. This is very much a software engineer's perspective of things. It is only an overview. There are some small examples here, um, and we can take a little bit of time just to have a crack at those if you wish. Um, but really, I then want to just point you to where you can learn much more because we could do a week, whole weekend just on hardware modeling. And I'm going to focus on the tools that are open source uh, for all the reasons that open source is a good idea. So let's have a look at the ways of modeling. Well, we used one yesterday when we did simulation, and it's what's called event driven simulation. Uh, basically, it models all the mostly clock events, but some asynchronous events that happen on your chip. Um, and it models it in full detail. It doesn't act, it's capable of just not just modeling is this signal high or is this low, but is it a strong signal, is it a weak signal, is it an undefined signal, is it an undriven signal. Uh, it can model in great detail. It can model more than just the uh, clock cycles themselves. It can model the shape of the rise of the clock, the shape of the fall of the clock, which for detailed timing analysis can be very important. So, um, it can model anything you can buy in Verilog or the HDL or Verilog's modern descendant system Verilog. Um, there are three commercial tools from the three big EDA companies, ModelSim from Mental Graphics, uh, NC from uh, Cadence and VCS from Synopsys. They are fast and proprietary and expensive. Um, if you buy a single license, it's probably about $30,000 a year. Um, there is open source, Icarus Verilog is the big one. Um, there is also GHDL, which is a, a GNU project and which, deal, which, sim, which simulates a VHDL. Um, I haven't got much experience with GHDL, I don't think it's as mature. That level of modeling detail comes at a cost, which is performance. Um, and on a very big chip, you can have performances where you can only model one clock cycle per second. Um, if you want to model a chip that's supposed to go at 100 million clock cycles, then that's going to take you a long time to get anywhere. Uh, Icarus Verilog, it's free, it's not as fast as the commercial simulator, so it'd be even worse if you try to use Icarus Verilog for a chip like that. So we can, one way we can do that is to throw away a lot of the information if it doesn't matter to us. For most of the things we want to model on a silicon chip, we only really care if a signal is high or low, is it one or zero? Certainly, say if we want to know how to interact with any software, that is more than sufficient. And really, we're not terribly concerned about the rise and fall of the clock edges uh, for many applications. We just want to know, does the signal go on, does it go off? And for that, you can do what's called cycle-accurate modeling, where you only worry about what happens at clock edges. As the clock goes up, what the values, and you only worry about zeros and ones and not undefined values and strong signals and weak signals. There are a number of tools available, and they all have the same restriction, which is that they are not simulation tools in the way that the event-driven simulators are. They're actually synthesis tools in the way that Quartus synthesized a bitstream. But instead of synthesizing bitstreams for FPGA or layouts for ASICs, they're actually synthesizing C or C++ or a similar language. And because of that, they can't do the whole of Verilog or the HDL or System Verilog. We may, not have, we may not have really got into this depth yesterday, but Verilog can describe more than just a synthesizable chip. It can describe behavior outside chip. And when you wrote a test bench yesterday, you had that uh, basics underscore TV. One of the things it did was it spontaneously generated a clock. Now that's not something you can actually do on a physical chip. You have to inject a clock in from outside. 
So it's what's called non-synthesizable variable. Fine for test benches and for testing things, but you can't actually make it into a chip. Um, because these cycloactive modeling tools are using a synthesis approach, they can only actually model the physical chip. So when we look at the examples today, we'll see you can only model, model basic stop B, the actual synthesizable design, not basic underscore TB not B, because that has non-synthesizable stuff in it. Commercially, there's now only one uh, uh, product available from Carbon Designer, uh, from Carbon Design Systems. There were two. The other one was called VTOC. It was produced by the company I ran in Cambridge, which was acquired uh, by Arc International and others that became part of Synopsis. Um, and now they only use the tool in house. But there is a very good open source tool, Verilator, to the extent that people are dropping columns to it in, in, in favour of Verilator because it's actually more powerful. The other thing about Cyclac, I've talked about tools that can generate, take the Verilog and turn it into a synthesizer into a C model. There is nothing to stop you hand writing a model as a C program. You can write a model. And there is a language which I shall touch on briefly called System C, which is particularly geared towards writing those models. And lastly, I've talked about modeling. If you want to go really fast, even cyber accurate modeling isn't sufficient. And for many applications, you don't need that level of detail. If you want to see how a processor, complete processor like Open Risk works, you don't really need to know what's going on in each clock cycle. You really just want an instruction set simulator, which tells you this instruction does that. And there is a form of modeling called transaction level modeling. I will briefly touch on it, but mostly just to point to other documentation to talk about it, because we don't have enough time to go into transaction level modeling. And lastly, alongside all of these, I'm just mentioning a tool, mostly because we'll use it, which is when you simulate stuff, how do you see the output from your simulation? Well, of course, you can, you know, you can print outputs as part of the model that you build. But one of the useful things is to do wave trace visualization, which is what we did yesterday with model sim, where we can see the wave traces. Now, I'll talk about how we generate the data for wave traces, and then there's an open source tool called GTK Wave, which you can use to visualize those traces. And again, it's another example of an open source tool that's increasingly becoming used as a mainstream tool because in some respects it has better features than the commercial tools. Uh, the commercial tools are all features of the commercial simulators. So Model Sim has a wave viewer, NC has a wave viewer, PCS has a wave viewer. So GTK Wave, uh, it's an open source waveform viewer. It runs on Windows, it runs on Linux, it's on source forge. Um, if you're running Linux, you can, it'll be part of your standard distribution. You can do yum install or apt get install uh, to get GTK Wave. Um, and the data it takes is what are called Verilog uh, change dump files. So value change. Oh, sorry, value. Value, yes, because you can generate from VHDL as well. Value change dump files, that's a correction for the slide. Value change dump files basically record every time any of the signals or wires or registers in your design changes in a file. You can appreciate as you simulate a big chip, that file gets huge. Um, GTK, GTK Wave, like all these other tools, can read those and allow you to display the signals. We'll look at that briefly in a minute. Because VCDs get so big, there are more compact formats which various tools support, which are not so standardized. VCD is a standard format in the IEEE standards for very long VHDL. And GTK Wave has a, a, a sister command called Twin Wave, which allows you to view two waveforms at once. And if you're trying to see why something's gone wrong when you change something, the ability to look at two waves alongside each other and see when the wave trace changes is very powerful. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's a dead, dead useful tool. So, what about an example so we can try this? Well, we need to generate some VCD files. So let's have a look at some of the modeling technology and then we'll come back to GTK Wave. So first of these is Icarus Verilog. It's an open source uh, simulator. It supports all of the Verilog standards, 95, 2001, 2005. And the latest version has some support for system Verilog, uh, 2005 and 2009. It does not support VHDL. And 
Although it's good, it is significantly slower, like probably a factor of 50 times slower than commercial simulators. Now, let's try using it. So, how many people here have got Icarus Verilog installed? Right, so gather around someone who's got it installed if you want to have a look. Um, I will also be on I will also Okay, so we run Icarus Verilog. Sorry. At which, at which stage does uh, Icarus become uh, significantly slower? I mean, is this at the... Uh, at the model execution stage. No, no, it, 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 how, how big of a design does it need to be actually bigger? It, 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 it will, I mean, I, a few years ago, I modeled the whole of Orpsoc, yeah. and it runs a few kilohertz. Okay? We know that the commercial simulator would have run at more than 50 kilohertz. So that's, that, that, that sort of so, But running at a few kilohertz, you can do quite a lot of useful stuff. Um, but we'll come to that very fast. Um, for, for small designs, it's all things we're doing on D nanos, yeah. It's going to be fine. Um, so people can see, it's just I had one idea earlier. So I'm in the basics directory here, and so the first thing you do is you ask Eucalyptus Verilog to take your Verilog source files, just give a list of Verilog source files, and compile it into a, a, a form for efficient simulation. And we give that, I've given it an output name, you can call it what I have, which called it basics. And then there is a sister program called VVP to actually run the simulation. So we run VVP. And it's simulating. Now you can see the immediate problem here. There is no output. This is a chip. It doesn't. It's not software. It doesn't generate. So it is actually simulating. It is making my computer get warm. But there is nothing <laughs> actually to show there. If I do Control C to interrupt it, because the test bench is here, you see it's actually modelled uh, either 10 million or 100 million ticks. I can't see how many digits there are there. Um, but it's just going around, the clock's ticking away, it's looping away, it's fine. So let's finish that. Um, and actually we've done a simulation, but it's not terribly exciting. Um, let's bring our presentation back up. So. Let's go on to the next stage. Let's now actually try and generate a dump. Now, I actually changed the source file, I'll show you this in a moment, because you, the test as we had it originally didn't try and generate a VCD. You actually have to tell the test bench to create a dump file. So I've added some instructions there, I've made them conditional on a symbol called IV dump. So if, you put, if you've got the very latest version of the Git tree, you'll see you can it's got some code in there, I'll show you in a minute. We can then compile it, run it, and so forth, and this time we'll have a VCD file generated and we can view it. So, first of all, here is the Yes. Here you'll see tick if death, that's the equivalent of hash if death in C. We've got a little initial block and it calls the system uh, function dollar dump file to give it the name of a dump file and then it says dollar dump vars. And with no arguments, dump vars means dump anything you can find in this program. You can, that one way of reducing the uh, size of dump files is to use dump vars just to give a subset of signals that you want to dump. Okay, so that's the change we've made. And now, if we go... <coughs> yes, 
This time, I'll run my command, but with the minus div dump. The minus d simulate, as you recall, in the actual design, there were some commented out comments at the top saying, for simulation, we don't we want to make things a bit. Uh, we don't even want to use a 32-bit clock, we want to use an 8-bit counter instead, just so it goes through quicker. I've slightly changed the code, so I've put a, a tick define around that just to make it easy to make that change rather than to keep on editing it. Um, so let's run that. Let's run VVP again. And away it's going. And we do have one change because it actually tells us but it's open a VCD because there is some output that comes from actually doing that dollar dump file. Um, but it's still going around forever. And it's now going a little slow because it's actually having to generate all that output. Let's finish. dump.vcd and it's probably quite big. So it's 168 meg from running for a few seconds on a tiny design. <laughs> so when I say they can get big, they, you can do a whole, you do a long run on a whole processor and you can blow your disk up. Um, so let's have a look at that and this is where we use GTK wave and we give it the name of the VCD and up fires GTK wave and initially it's not terribly exciting and not just because it's in behind the air conditioning okay so we've got a screen and on the left it just says basics TV now you recall that was the top level module in the test bench and what did that test bench do? It instantiated the design, the instance, which was called basic zero, which was the one instance of the basics module. And of course, the basics module itself inst instantiated the edge detecting module. So, as we click on each of those, we can see the signals that are available in them. So at the top level, the test bench, we've got the clock. So what we can do is we can append that to the screen, and that looks like a pretty plain line, but of course one of the problems is we don't know how much resolution. If we come down to a slightly better resolution, we can start to see that clock there. If we click on the actual design itself, well there's clock 50 there. Let's have a pen there. Not surprising it's identical because those are the wires we connected when we instantiated one and the other. Um, let's have a look at some other interesting signals. Let's have a look at our, our Slow clock, there's uh, slow clock. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's going on there. And let's have a look at our count and our LED out. If you zoom out, yeah, 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 I'm getting there. I'm getting there. The red is there because in simulation we haven't initialized those at the start of the, the simulation. Red, and you can see the little X is written there. It's the simulator, remember it's a full-blown simulator, it can tell you not just naught and one, but undefined. It's saying those signals are undefined. If we zoom out, as it comes out of reset, there, if we go back in again, we start to see everything's got defined. That still um, needs us to look a bit further. Though. Let's come back out again and see where something interesting starts happening. Up here which is where we start to see slow clock changing. And there you can see our count, our LED is happening. And they're identical because remember they were assigned one to the other. And we've got our slow clock. And in this case, the slow clock is designed to go at half the speed of the full clock because we've got that minus D simulate as opposed to one sixty-four thousandth of the speed of the uh, uh, fast clock. So you can see how this is a very useful tool for seeing exactly what's happening inside your design. Any questions? Yes, I didn't get the build file. I think I might have missed a step somewhere. 
Um, probably when did you? Um, I need to comment something out in the. Ah, have you got the ver have you got the very latest version of the code? Yes, I have. Oh, you have. So the key bit was let's get rid of the UK wave was this bit. But when you did the, it's you defined IV underscore dump because that that is the thing that causes it to you do the. Seems to be in there. Sorry. Seems to be in there. No, that's just I'll, I, I will come and do a one on one afterwards. Okay, let's go back to the where we were before. Uh, so there we are, Icarus Verilog, GTK webpages. We'll go through now to the next bit. So Verilator, and this is what I want, want to really concentrate on. Um, it's an open source tool that takes Verilog and System Verilog and synthesizes C++ or System C. And remember, it's synthesis only. The models are two state. In other words, only zero or one that we know about. There's zero delay. In Verilog, you can do clever things where you say this signal starts a little bit later than another signal. That all gets blown away. And they're cycle accurate, so they only tell you what happens on clock edges. What's it used for? System verification, because it goes much faster. If you need to, to Verilog, if you need to verify your design is good by running loads and loads of tests, having a faster model helps. It's used for regression testing on server farms. And part of the reason for that is it doesn't have any licensing fees because it's open source. If you want to run a thousand instances of, of you know, Cadence's NC simulator, you're going to have to spend a fortune in license fees, whereas you don't have to with Verilator. Um, so I can buy a hundred Linux boxes uh, or a hundred Linux processes for, processors for around $10,000, which is less than the price of a single simulator fee. And, I can run lots of it. and it's also a very good way of modeling simple processors, well any processor, but for practical purposes, simple processors, to allow people to develop software on them. If you buy, if you, if you use Atmel AVR processors like my Arduino, you can actually get a free tool from Atmel called Atmel Studio, which allows you to develop code, it's a nice development environment, and it includes a cycle accurate simulator of the processors. And those cycle accurate simulators are now done with Verilator, and that Verilator is maintained by Embercost. So, so we right. spend our time making sure you can model your Arduinos. There we are. How is it developed? Originally by DEC in 1994, who open sourced it in 1998, which is actually a very enlightened approach. A gentleman called Wilson Schneider, who works part-time for me now, uh, took it over in 2001 and completely rewrote it in C++. Um, my company provides commercial support and development. So what's the modeling process? Well, we take the, the well, any code, I said a processor, but in this case we're going to do a simple term. DUT is a term you will see very often in chip design. It means device under test. And that's typically the thing that's synthesizable. It's actually going to be the chip. So the device under test here is, test, is basics.v, but not basics underscore tv. So, you put it to Verilator, which will generate either a C++ or System C cycle accurate model. You might have some other C programs you want to import there, but most of all, because we no longer have a test bench in Verilog, we're going to have to provide a C++ test bench or via a number of other processes. Okay? And when we combine those two, we get results and we get a VCD option the out as well. So, what about this C++ test bench? This is available as uh, basics underscore main dot cpp in the very latest uh, uh, pull, pull from the Git, Git repository. Um, first of all, our top level module in the device is called basics, remember? So but that will be what Verilator calls its top level class. In fact, it puts a V in front of it, so you know it's a Verilator one. So we're going to generate a C class called vbasics, and the header will be in vbasics.h. So whatever your top level modules call, that's, well, that's going to be there. So that's why it's vbasics.h. V for Verilator, the name of the top module is .h. Then you have to include the standard Verilator model header, verilator.h. And lastly, because I'm doing some C++ I.O., I've got I.O. stream there. And here's my wrapper, a main program, 
a number of those arguments can impact on the underlying validator system. So the first thing you do is you pass any command arguments in to a, a static function, validated colon command args, just to, that will process any validator specific arguments. And then I'm instantiating a copy of my model. Remember, it's generated a C++ class named after our top level module, which was basics. The class is called vBasics, therefore. And I'm going to instantiate it called top, so that I'll, I'll create a new lesson. So top is an instance of the vBasics class, which is the class that represents our model. I'll come back to these in a moment. Having got my class top, I can read and write the input and output ports. Okay? So remember we have a top level input uh, port for the two keys, button and reset, which um, was called key. And if those buttons are not pressed, which is the normal mode, they should be one. So the two bits one, one, gives you hex three. Um, and the top level clock is clock 50, so I'm going to set that clock initially to zero. Um, I'll come back to the old lead stuff in a moment. And then here is my main simulation loop. And I call top eval. And that says advance the state of the model on the basis of all the inputs you have in your hand. Okay. Ignore this bit here, I'm going to come back to it in a moment. And then I toggle the clock. So if clock is clock 50 is naught, then it'll become 1. If it's 1, it'll become naught. And I go round again. Right. So now let's come back to what we're doing with the LED stuff. I've, there I've got my basic loop of call eval, toggle the clock, call eval, toggle the clock. One of the top level outputs is the LEDs. Okay. Now, if you recall, the LEDs uh, change as the slow clock changes. Now, I don't want to print out the value of LED on every clock cycle in this example, just because there'll be loads and loads when it's exactly the same, and then it goes as the slow clock changes. So what I thought I'd do is I'd have a, a local variable called old LED, which tracked top LED's previous value. And I'll start up just by reading the value of LED before we start, whatever Verilator has created it to start with, and I'll give it a value that's different, so they're initially different. And that's only because when I get here, whenever after the eval, the LED has changed from its old value, I'll print out the LED equals and the value from the top there. Okay? So it's just a, a C variable to keep track of when something's changed. And this is just to make sure the very first time it gets printed out by guaranteeing the first value has changed. So that's the first thing that's going on. We're reading the top LED to see what the LED value has changed. So every time the LED value changes, it'll print out this message LED equals. And then, this is going to be important in the, in the future, but because it's a cycle accurate model, it has no concept of time. It just has a concept of cycles going past. So I've just created myself a variable, and Verilator gives you some useful predefined types, so you, uh, including one for an unsigned integer, which is VL up U in 64T, and you want time to be a big value because it can get large numbers. Okay? And so we've created this variable main time we've set to naught, and on each clock edge, we just advance the time by one. So we've got a, a concept of time, if you like, it's a count of the cycles times two. Okay? Because the two clock cycles, uh, one, one up, one down, all the time the last one. So let's build the Verilator model, and this is where we try. So this is what we do. We say Verilator minus D simulate, so we get the simulation version of the thing. Minus CC to create a C++ model, as opposed to a system C model. And then the device under test. Remember, basics.v, we're not modeling the test bench here, because it's not synthesized. And then with minus XC, we give our C++ test bench. Okay? So do try that um, if you've got Verilator installed. And what will happen is you'll find you get a whole load of warnings. And the reason is that Verilator is very, very good at checking for what it considers good design style. And so it doesn't like SARS Verilog. Um, <laughs> And what it's complaining here, if we look at the code, 
Line 77, 81 and 82, it's moaning about. Let's have a look at what it really is moaning about. Is it working for us? And the answer is, well, it's being a little pedantic. Okay? What it's complaining about, what was it? Uh, It, it's complaining about these three lines here. It's complaining about a sign slow clock, a sign reset, and sign button. And the reason is, in Verilog, if you use an assign with a signal name that hasn't been declared, Verilog assumes you meant to declare a wire with that name. There's an implicit declaration. And Verilator is saying, this is not always considered good design practice. You should explicitly declare your wires. So you should have said, Wire slow clock and then sign slow it's clock. It's not complaining about LED out, which, is, which I did declare. Exactly. So there's no complaint because LED out was complete. So it's just the next line. It's the exact slow button. clock, reset, and button. Of the and then the next one is LED out, which I did declare and it's not complaining about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so good. Verilator got it right. Um, Verilator is actually a very good linting tool. Okay. You may disagree. Not everyone agrees. I mean, it's Wilson Snyder's view of what's good design. Okay. But it does give you warnings about all sorts of things. So, fortunately, it also allows you to turn the warnings off. <laughs> That's the key. So, you can say minus W, the warning is called implicit. It's warning you about implicit declarations. But you can just say minus W, no hyphen, and then the name of the warning. And if you run that, Verilator will create your model. And for those who are masochistic, you can say minus W all. <laughs> there are some warnings that even Wilson recognises are so pedantic that it would annoy people if he always had them on. But you can turn them on. For example, in our test bench, we've just used two or three of the inputs and outputs of the model. But in fact, if you recall, when we find basics, there's all these GPIO and pins and everything. And if you do minus all, it will moan like hell about the fact you haven't set most of the inputs and you aren't using most of the outputs. Okay? I, I leave that as an exercise for the reader. So that's generated all the C++ model and you'll see it generate an immense amount of C++ code and it puts it in a separate directory to avoid cracking everything up. So if you look you'll see you've got a directory called Obstier and it even creates you a, 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 a model. So you can say make minus f and see, the make file, again, derived from the name of your top-level mod uh, module, vbasics.make. Um, and the target you want to create is the actual vbasics executable. And it will create an executable program called vbasics. And you can run that. So let's quickly go and do that. So there's, I've run Verilator with that known visit and it's turned things off. And let's go into the object directory. Let's run make. And run V2V basics. And now we can say that's created V basics. Let's run it. And where it runs, and I, I'm not sure if you looked, but the last test of the loop was to go round that test bench loop until that LED got the value of FC. Okay, and then it finished. Okay? Right, so that's the whole Verilator thing done. We've gone down. Tracing with Verilator. Um, I'm just looking at time. <coughs> I, I'm, I'll leave people who want to do this I think to do it on their own rather than stop them to do it. Tracing with Verilator, you actually have to tell the, te the test bench has to do a bit of driving. You need an extra header, which is for generating VCD, it's got extra stuff in there. You need to set up tracing before the main loop. Now, if you're doing tracing, this symbol will be defined, so always tie it in within hash if VM trace. Okay, which is set if you've built a model with minus minus trace. You need to turn on the tracing with trace ever on. 
you need to create a new tracing object, variable BCDC, and that's what's used to control the tracing. In the actual model, remember top is the instance of V of V basics, you have to tell it, you have to call its trace function and give it the tracer object. And 99 is actually the depth in the hierarchy that you want to trace signals. So of course we only have two depths of hierarchy, the main module and the event detector. But this is a way of controlling how much you generate for the trace. And then we need to open a VCD file. Then in the main loop, after we've done eval, we actually need to tell it to done. <coughs> and for a VCD, it needs to know about time, because otherwise it doesn't know where the various signals should go. And that's why it was important for us to count time, because we need to tell the dump at what time point this is being made. Okay? And lastly, we tidy up at the end, after the end of the loop, we actually have to tell it to close the, the, the trace. And now you generate, this time you give Verilator the minus trace flag to so say, I want to build a model suitable for tracing. You build it as before, you run it as before, but this time you will have a dump file and you can run GT wave, GTK wave on that to have a look at that. And as an exercise, use twin wave to compare with the VCD you got from Icarus Verilog. Okay. I'm not going to stop and do that. I need that as an exercise. If anyone wants to do this, I'm quite happy to come around one on one afterwards and just show you how to do this. So, system C is just, it was, a, it was part of the hardware industry, it came out of Synopsis originally, it is an idea to support the handwriting of models originally. And it's actually just a template library for C. But it introduces the concept of modules, which are similar to very old modules. Modules are connected via ports, and then it defines a set of C++ types to represent the sort of connection, whether it's a simple wire, or a buffer, or a FIFO. Um, and those modules have a set of processes. Okay? And those processes are triggered by events, such as a change on one of the ports or something. And there's two sorts. You can have threads, and they run like operating system processes. They run forever and they can be preempted. So they can, they can suspend. There is no preemption in System C. System C, you can't say, hoi you, stop. Something has to voluntarily relinquish. So it's not preemption. What's the word you use for that? Um, it's, it, they, so they can suspend, a thread can suspend execution to allow another thread to run. It's not preempted. Methods have to run, they just run once from start to finish and then they're done. And you cannot, a thread, a, a method cannot stop. So there's the two sort of processes you have and they mirror pretty much what you do in hardware with an always block. There isn't a main function in a standard system C module. That's actually the main function is provided by the library, which you must then define an SC main library an SC main library, and that's an SC main function. The SC main function, all those modules, which are classes, have to be instantiated. You connect them up, all their ports, using those special C types that represent wires, FIFOs, and buffers, and so forth. Once they're instantiated and connected, you then call SC start. And the system C model will start generating stimuli and because those various processes in the modules are sensitive to those stimuli, things will start happening. There is one other thing that comes with System C. Um, system C, I should say, is effectively open source. For technical legal reasons, it is not, strictly speaking, compliant with the open source definition. Um, but for all practical purposes, it is. Um, what is a transaction level model? If you want to get to a higher level modeling than Verilator or simulation, a transaction level model gives you that level of abstraction. If you think of Verilator or Icarus Verilog, they basically, the clock moves on, all the components advance their state. The clock moves on, all the components advance their state. Instead, transaction level model is built as a set of processes which communicate via messages. And this means that the various components only compute when they have something to do. If you look at a Verilator model, despite the best attempts at optimization, almost all the time, 
you advance the clock and say to all the bits, do you need to change anything? And they say, oh, no, 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 no. So you end up looking across the whole model, almost all of which does nothing. TLM, because you have processes, processes only do something when they get a message, otherwise they don't do anything at all. And that makes them much more efficient, so where you can run an Icarus Verilog model of open risk at 2 or 3 kilohertz, and you can run a Verilator model of it at 150 kilohertz, you can potentially run a TLM of uh, an open risk at, at many megahertz. And this idea of processes communicating with each other is actually quite a good hardware abstraction because it mirrors the way components talk across buses. So typically you'll have components representing the various blocks and they'll be connected by something that looks like buses. And here's a little picture that shows you you've got these modules and they're connected by sockets and they will send messages with payloads between each other. So that connection there would be like a bus on your design. I really don't... This, uh, this, this is really just to give you a flavour of what's potentially there, because what matters is further reading. GTK, Kway, Vicarus and Verilator, they all have their own websites. Embercosm does a series of application notes. Application note 6 is about high-performance SOC modelling with Verilator, and that will take you through a full example of, in fact, using Verilator to model the open risk. More on System C, it's an IEEE standard, 1666, and it is free, which is unusual for IEEE standards. Um, it also has its own system organisation. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Cathedral and the Bazaar, System C is a grand example of the Cathedral way of doing stuff. Every few years, the great gurus in the middle dump on you another version of System C. Um, they really don't get the hang of community involvement at all. But there's a lot of good resources on there, so the great gods have provided you with some good resources. Um, for more on transaction level modeling, of course, there's stuff on systemc.org, but I wrote an application note when the first systemc TLM stuff came out on how to build a particular sort of transaction level model. There are actually multiple sorts, one called a loosely timed model, um, and again, a vote for risk is the example, and that application note is available there. So that's all I have on modelling. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we're now going to try and get into the practical side of trying to model uh, open risk on D-Nano, which Julius is going to lead. If anyone wants to know more about the modelling side of it, just call me and ask me.